We have been reading through the book of Hebrews during this season, and we come uh, today to the last chapter of that book, chapter 13, where we read uh, first few verses and then verses 7 and 8. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitalities to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who were ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some things never change, do they? The sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. It doesn't matter where you stand or which, which direction that you may be looking in. There will always be taxes, no matter who is president or which party controls Congress. And somehow, Tom Brady will always be in the Super Bowl. <laughs> or at least so it seems. And though his team may not win, Brady himself, he can pretty much go to Disney World anytime he wants, I suspect. But having said all that, there is one certainty that's even more unchanging than anything else, which is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Quite literally, he, he is himself, otos, and no one but himself. Whether it's yesterday, ekthos, that is in times past, or it's today, semeron, or it's right now, or it's in all the ages, all the aeones, all the eons yet to come. For far above and beyond anyone else, Jesus Christ is the unchanging God. Now that's significant because despite what some of those other physical realities I mentioned may suggest, Tom Brady notwithstanding, you and I live in a rather swiftly changing world in which almost everything around us is constantly evolving and shifting on us. When I was a teenager, like some of you, the world was a very different place, for instance. The, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were locked in a Cold War with no real good ending in sight. Who, who could have imagined that the Berlin Wall would finally come down one day? Personal computers and mobile cell phones were science fiction at best, right up there with those flying cars of the Jetsons. I'm still waiting for those. And for much of the world, life expectancy and health standards were far from what they are now. But then, when my parents were teenagers, and their parents were prior to them, it was even more dramatically different. This past week, I, I finally broke down and opened up two really large plastic bins that had been in my garage since we moved here. Uh, they contained uh, old family photo albums from my parents and my grandparents. That's my grandmother on the left as a child with her brother and sister. All of a time long since passed. Some of them more than a century old. There was even a whole collection of photos on which my mother had written interesting pictures of people we don't know. <laughs> And they were. If they ever build another Cracker Bell near us, I, I got the walls covered for them. But all you have to do is look into the faces of those people. And you can see that their lives were dramatically different from ours. Life has changed for all of us. Only as Malachi 3, 6 reminds us, as Hebrews does here, God himself changes not. And similarly, despite what some might tell you, neither has God changed his expectations for you and for me. So the unknown writer of the book of Hebrews that we've been looking at for the past month concludes his or her words here in chapter 13, 
with a series of practical guidelines on, on how to serve God, how to live out a faith that perseveres, how to be faithful no matter what the time or the circumstances all around us might be. And it all starts with this simple admonition that we ought to keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Literally, let brotherly love, Philadelphia, abide. To express it more directly, we need to full-on Philly each other. Turn to your neighbor right now and say that, you need to Philly me. Full-on. All right. And I need to Philly you. <laughs> Full-on. It's what the word means in Greek. That's why the city in, Phil in, up in Pennsylvania is named such. Philos, Philos is a loving friend. Adelphos is a brother. Philadelphia is thus affection for our brothers and sisters, by which the writer means those who are fellow believers in Christ. And in that respect, the whole New Testament is full of this same idea. Jesus told the Pharisees, for instance, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Matthew 22. He told, this, told his disciples they should love each other, John 13. Paul told the Romans, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love each other, Romans 13. Peter told his readers to have sincere love for each other, to love one another deeply from the heart, 1 Peter 1. St. John proclaimed that anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. There's nothing in them to make them stumble. He added that love comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, 1 John 4. But it's not always easy, is it? Sometimes the people of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ, church people, <laughs> can be particularly difficult to love. I speak as a pastor of more than 40 years here, but I suspect most of you can agree with this, can't you? Have you known difficult church people? Yeah. Hmm. But when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord, he grafts you, so to speak, into his family. So we really are all brothers and sisters, which means we are expected to treat each other with two things that are increasingly endangered species in this world, respect and affection. But if that weren't enough, as if to, to push the point even further, the writer then tells us we are to show hospitality not just to those who we know, our brothers and sisters, but to strangers as well, to exercise not just Philadelphia, but Philoxenia as well. And if the word seems, it sounds a little familiar in today's cultural conversation, it's because xenos, as in xenophobia, does indeed refer to foreigners and aliens, but not the kind from outer space. And there's a context for this admonition in the early church. In New Testament times, Christians who might travel beyond their homes found that accommodations were generally quite expensive, while conversely rather seedy at the same time. You didn't want to stay in most of the inns, if, even if you could find one or afford one, because they had a very bad reputation. And so Christians stayed with Christians, even if they never met before. Believers in Christ opened their homes up to other believers, and not just begrudgingly, but with magnanimity, treating their guests nobly in a way to bring them refreshment. That's what philoxenia means. In my early years, when I served as a missionary, going in and out of communist Eastern Europe. It was a place in the Austrian Alps called Haas Rosenhof. And if you were working as a missionary behind the Iron Curtain, when you came out, you could always go there. It didn't cost a cent. I was always exhausted, tensed uh, when I arrived. It was very stressful working in those places. And they would, they would greet me, take, they would take my bag from my hand, they would, they would uh, take it up to my room, they'd draw me a warm bath, and after I had cleaned up and rested, I would come downstairs to the smell of a freshly baked apple pie. 
still cooling. I only stayed a night, but it was the best night I could imagine. For the Christians at Haas Rosenhaus clearly had this gift of hospitality. I think it's a and b now. <laughs> you have to pay for it. <laughs> but this practice should not be limited. The writer tells us we should all have this same mindset. I think of a, of a county farm agent many years ago who had to go to a farm in his district. As he walked up the dirt road leading to it, he saw signs that said, trespassers will be shot. Beware of dog. Keep out. This means you. When he arrived... He was greeted at the door, however, by a smiling, congenial man who welcomed him in. And when he'd finished his business, the county agent got up to leave, but the farmer said to him, come and see me again sometime. I don't get many visitors up this way. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. And I wonder, too, what kind of signs and signals we put out, visibly or invisibly, subtly in other ways. Now, there are limits to our hospitality, just as there were when these verses were written. In the, in the Didache, that was a, uh, a teachings, early Christian guidebook written by the second, uh, the, the second generation of church fathers. It's written, let every apostle who comes to you be received as to the Lord, but he must not stay more than one day or two if it's absolutely necessary. If he stays three days, he's a false prophet. <laughs> And if he asks for money, he's a false prophet. Within reasonable limits, we're called to exercise hospitality. The example given is plainly that of Abraham, who entertained, gave lodging to, received as guest, as the writer here suggests, angels, one of whom was the Lord himself, without knowing it. Can you imagine? It's a bit like the old, the old comedian Charlie Chaplin. When he read once that there was a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest, he entered it anonymously just for fun. He came in sixth place. <laughs> <laughs> he was right in front of them. They, they didn't recognize him and know him. I wonder how often God is in front of us and we don't recognize him either entertained angels unawares. Which is why third, uh, th 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 this writer tells us we ought to likewise continue to, to remember those in prison too, as if we were together with them, literally as if you and I were bound with them, leg iron to leg iron. See, in the time of the early church, prisoners were on their own to secure food and supplies. The prison didn't provide them, which meant that a family or a friend or somebody on the outside had to bring them in for that prisoner. And Christians did that, not just for other believers, some of whom had been put in prison because they were believers, but they did it for all kinds of people, so much so that even, even the heathen admired them for it. That's why I'm so thankful that Christ Church has followed the example, not just of those in the early church, but of the first Methodist as well. The first thing John Wesley did when he came to faith was to begin visiting in the prisons. I'm thankful we have a robust prison ministry. Uh, to, to be sure, some go as they're allowed to, some stay and some pray, but we can all have a part. Our calling is to have a true connection with those brothers and sisters in white. That's what they are, brothers and sisters. Decades ago, a man named Lewis Laws became the warden of what was then the toughest prison in the country, a place in New York called Sing Sing. Sing Sing had a reputation for destroying wardens. The average tenure of a warden in Sing Sing was less than two years. In fact, it used to be said that the easiest way to get out of Sing Sing was to go in as a warden. <laughs> but Lewis stayed 21 years. And when he retired, that prison had become very different indeed. It had turned from being the toughest, roughest, most cruel place in the whole system 
to being a rather humane institution. When he was asked about what transformed it, Lewis uh, Law said he owed it all to his wonderful wife, Catherine. Everybody warned her she should never set foot inside those prison walls, but when the first prison basketball game was held, she went walked into the gym with her three beautiful children, she sat in the stands with the inmates. Her attitude was, my husband and I are, are going to take care of these men. I believe they will take care of me. I don't have to worry. Catherine insisted in getting acquainted with those in that prison and their records. She encouraged them. She ran errands for them. She spent time listening to them. She cared. She discovered one convicted murderer was blind, so she paid him a visit. Holding her, his hand in hers, she said, do you read Braille? And he said, what's Braille? So she taught him how to read. Years later, he would weep in love for her. Later, Catherine found a deaf mute in that prison. She went to school to learn how to sign language. Many said, Catherine, Catherine Laws was the body of Jesus that came alive in Sing Sing. Um, others said she walked into hell to show those men there was a piece of heaven. And then tragedy struck when she was killed in an accident. When Lewis Laws didn't come to work one day, it seemed almost instantly that the prison knew something was wrong. The following day, her body was resting in a casket in her home, three quarters of a mile from the prison. As the acting warden took his early morning walk, he was shocked to see a large crowd of the toughest, meanest looking criminals gathered like a herd of animals at the main gate. He came closer and he noted tears running down their faces, tears of grief and sadness. He knew how much they loved Catherine. So he turned and faced the men and he said, all right, men, you can go. Just be sure to check in tonight. Then he opened the gate and a parade of criminals, felons, lifers, murderers, thieves, walked, no guard, three quarters of a mile to stand in line and pay their final respects to Catherine Laws. And every one of them checked back in that night. Everyone. Because when you live a life of, of love and a life of praise before God, as Catherine Laws did, others can't help but notice that. Those who follow Christ are called to care for anyone who is ill-treated, just as if they themselves were the ones who were suffering. See, in the end, Though the world has changed, the needs of those around us, they haven't changed at all. Our grandparents and our great-grandparents, uh, some of the folks in the pictures I found, uh, they, they traveled in Model Ts and, and before that in wagons. We traveled, at least we used to, hopefully will again soon, in hybrid automobiles and, and, and planes. They wrote letters, and, and they had to wait weeks for an answer to get to them. We send emails or texts, and we get frustrated if it takes more than a few minutes to, to get a response back. They may have had few material goods. We are swamped by them. But all those changes are really only on the surface of life. Our nature hasn't changed. Our desires haven't, haven't, haven't decreased. Our real needs haven't diminished. The true dimensions of life are the same. Birth and death, sin and sorrow, hope and fear. A picture isn't altered, as someone has said, simply because you put it in a different frame. We are the same as we were. But fortunately, God has not changed either. And he still has the same invitation you that are weary, come unto me, and I'll give you rest. I've come that you may have life and have it in abundance to the fullness. If anyone says we have an appetite with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I ask you, dear sisters and brothers, for that's exactly who you are. 
Are you staying in love with each other? Are you showing hospitality to strangers? Are you remembering those who have found themselves caught by the chains of life, bound up, bundled off? For they're your brothers and sisters too. So are you being faithful to them and to the unchanging God, just as he has been faithful to you and to me? In the moment, we're going to close with a song that says, God's mercy never fails. He's led us through the fire in the darkest night, and we have lived in the goodness of God. We've lived in the goodness of God. For all of our lives, he has been faithful. For all of our lives, he has been so, so good. So with every breath that we are able, let us sing of the goodness of God. As we conclude this sermon series on being faithful, listen to how the writer of this book of Hebrews ends his or her words. Here she writes, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. All my life, he has been faithful. All your life, he has been so, so good. With every breath that we are able, may we sing of, may we live in the goodness of God. Let's pray together. Father, we find ourselves in a world that is like shifting sands all around us. But something never changes. And that is you and your love for us. You have brought us to a place today where we can live in your goodness further. May all who come behind us find us faithful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.